This coming Sunday, we are celebrating the first week of Advent, and I'd like to invite you to join me in this uh, Advent prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, send down your Spirit to guide us during Advent this year. May the Holy Spirit help us join you closer to you, and lift us up when we feel down, and lead us when we feel lost. We may stumble at times, but we know our ultimate journey is to draw closer to you and build your kingdom here on earth, a kingdom that Jesus' birth, life, and death help secure. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Kia and a good evening to everyone. Welcome to this year's final online educational event offered by the Catholic Theological College the sole provider of Catholic theological ministry and religious education qualifications in New Zealand. The Catholic Theological College teaches the Bachelor of Divinity degree and the Graduate Diploma in Theology, as well as the Level 5 New Zealand Certificate in Christian Studies and the Level 6 New Zealand Diploma in Christian Studies. The degree certificates and diplomas are all NZQA registered. Enrollment for next semester is ongoing. Please feel free to access our website for more information on enrollments. So once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Pope Francis reminds us that in the face of the difficulties of the modern age, artists and theologians need the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the source of joy and hope. With this in mind, we end the year with a special lecture on art and theology. Our speaker, Dr. Christopher Longhurst, will share his thoughts on pictorial art and how they can have an emotive and intellective God-centeredness not only when the artwork has a religious theme or spiritual value, but even for presumably secular artworks where the artist provides an aesthetic proof for the existence of God. Dr. Longhurst finished his studies in theology from the Pontificia Studiorum Universitas a Sancto Tome Aquinate in Urbe, or popularly called the Angelicum in Rome, Italy. Prior to returning to New Zealand in 2017, he worked as an operatore didactico, or educational officer, for the scientific and administrative management of the Vatican Museums in Rome. He also served as an assistant professor of philosophy and religious studies at al Aqawain University in Ifrane, Morocco. His primary academic interests revolve around intersections between theology and visual arts. Dr. Longhurst is a fellow of the King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue 2020 International Fellows Program. He also serves on the Council of the Wellington Theological Consortium, the Wellington Interfaith Council, and the New Zealand Catholic Bishops Committee for Interfaith Relations. Let's all welcome Dr. Christopher Longhurst. Thank you very much, On, and thank you, Jalvin. And hi, everyone. Kia ora tato. Welcome to Aesthetic Soul. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you for joining. I recognize some faces among you, but not all. So I really appreciate your participation. Ko Chris Longhurst Toku Enua. I am Chris Longhurst. Uh, no Ahueri Aho. Ke Maturoho Enohuana. I'm from Napier and currently living on Bluff Hill in Napier. So our exploration this evening is into the possibility of art, in particular pictorial art, and especially, and I emphasize especially non-religious art, um, as being a source of theology, that is a place we can go to to learn about God or to learn about what John Templeton called spiritual reality, um, and to do so in an interfaith or an interreligious way that is across religious borders. So the, the purpose is to um, deepen our appreciation of how art can be a, a source of theology. 
um, and the inten intended learning outcome, hopefully at the end of uh, this talk and our discussion, um, uh, what I hope is an intended learning outcome of tonight's uh, discussion is a, an appreciation of art as an interfaith tool. Uh, for, uh, for 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 um, theological uh, dialogue. A, qu a quick um, overview of the agenda for my presentation this evening. Um, first, I'd like to briefly look at what is a theological source, and then discuss how we're using the terms art and theology and the connections between them. And then we'll consider what art can be for theology as one of its sources. And then we'll consider some, some questions. Uh, why pictorial art? Why non-religious art? And why across religious borders? And then we'll end with Q&A and discussions and your observations and critiques of this question as well. So by just by way of introduction, a theological source is very simple. It's a place um, where we go to, to draw from to understand what we look at in theology. So the sources are the factors that contribute to our understanding of God and our perception of what it means to be a human person in light of that understanding. And uh, I think we all know that theology has, has um, many variations and that each variation has its own sources. However, there are basic primary and secondary sources in all the different varieties of theology, not just in Christianity, but most religions have places where they go to uh, uh, for, their, uh, for their academic content. Um, um, so we can refer to them as primary sources, and the primary sources are what a religion would um, see as its divine revelation, uh, which from a theological point of view is is perfectly open to um, in, to investigating in order to understand, but contrary to religious studies, it's it's typically not open to critique. Therefore, it's com it's it's not critical, but it's comprehensive, um, and they're the primary resources, and they're typically scripture and tradition. Um, and again, all religions have them. Um, you'll, you'll be quite familiar with the Christian uh, primary sources of theology which for Christians would be the sacred texts of uh, the First and Second Testaments, um, and the tradition would be uh, the councils and the creeds and the authoritative statements, etc. And then if you look at a religion like Islam, the sacred text would be the Quran, um, though Muslims wouldn't see it um, as, a, as a text, but more as the wooden law of Allah uh, that's revealed. So therefore, um, is, is, uh, that's a place where Muslims go to to understand God, uh, to the divine revelation, to the Quran. And Muslims would also go to the Hadith, which is the tradition. Um, and all other religions have their primary sources too. But then there's the secondary sources. And I think the secondary sources are more universal by their nature, meaning that they're the same across religions anyway, um, and they subsist in our own histories, our own experiences, um, even in our own human nature. Um, and, and typically, um, the standard secondary sources are reason, which helps us explain why we accept certain religious positions or reject them. A personal experience, believe it or not, is a source for theology, which provides knowledge through involvement in that, that experience. Um, emotions, our own feelings and responses are a theological source. Um, and um, natural revelation, as opposed to divine revelation, obviously creation, the world, uh, human history can tell us something about God. Well, simply what I'm proposing is that officially art should be among the secondary sources as a standard place for all religions across the world to go to to understand things about God and ultimate reality. Um, so... The idea here is to basically add art as a secondary source of theology. 
And obviously there are already some connections between the secondary sources and art. For example, experience, we experience art, art is emotional, art is creative. Uh, there's the creative side of the artist who creates the work of art. And there's the receptive side um, of the audience that creates meaning from the religious work of art as well. So already there's a direct overlap here between art and experience and emotions and, and natural revelation uh, through creation. Uh, but we're going to look at why across religious borders. But I'd just like to, um, re regarding what art is for theology, I'd just like you to listen to this trailer from an art historian, Harry Gladsby's book, Discovering God Through the Arts. Because um, Gladsby's work is similar to mine, though his book is about the arts in general. And shortly, I just want to come back to what is special about pictorial art. But just have a quick listen to this video, uh, this short um, trailer of Gladsby's work. Is a painting merely a pretty decoration on the wall? Is a movie more than just an escape? Can it teach you empathy or help you to heal? Is a song only holy if you sing it in church? And does a poem have the power to change your life? We only live on the aspire. Consumed by either fire or fire. When you ask little of the arts, you get little in return. But when you open your eyes to the beauty and creativity of the arts, you can discover God, the original artist. If you're willing to be still and take notice, God will reveal sacred bits of truth through poetry, music, visual arts, films, novels, dance, and theater. I was beginning to think that Christianity was quite sensible, apart from its Christianity. The award-winning author and art historian, Terry Glaspie, invites you to a faith-changing journey into the art world. Learn to see differently, to listen differently, to read, watch, and even pray differently. So my consideration here, which is slightly different to Gladsby, um, is that th th there's something special though about pictorial art, or something different about pictorial art that makes it more a theological source. And, and we'll come back to that shortly. Um, and, and not just um, religious pictorial art, um, but especially again, non-religious pictorial art. And we'll look at some voices that speak to that uh, shortly too. Um, Regarding the terms, how we can understand them uh, in relation to this thesis, uh, just to frame the discussion, uh, we are, we're using the institutional theory of art's definition of what art is, uh, which says that an object becomes art in the context of the institution known as the art world. Um, so if the art world considers the art prescinding our own personal taste, then I would claim that that work of art would have the merits to support this thesis. Um, so regarding art, if it's part of the art world, then it's art. Um, and shortly we'll, we'll, we'll see it. We'll see how even Pope Francis weighs in on some of the works of art that we criticize, um, uh, how, how, how useful they can also be for theology as well. Um, however, there's, a, there's another issue I briefly want to speak to here about theology. Um, because we're using, I'm using a definition of theology that's a little broader than the common one, faith-seeking understanding, uh, to encompass the academic side of, uh, of all religions. Um, so we're not talking about faith-seeking understanding, but, but about the seeking understanding of what is believed in faith. So, so uh, therefore, people without faith or of any faith could do that. They can seek to understand what the what the core is of what is believed in different faith traditions. So, theology in this context is about the faith content, what is believed and understood. Uh, so the important thing here is the seeking understanding of it, and that weighs into an idea that we'll look at shortly regarding art as being a cognitive tool, uh, similar to theology. So if theology is a seeking understanding, 
um, then, then art can also be a seeking understanding. And the question that follows is an understanding of what? So this, the, the following short video is from the Templeton Religion Trust um, and explores a similar topic that we're looking at tonight on the cognitive significance of art as it relates to spiritual reality to deepen our understanding. Um, so the correlation here is between theology seeking understanding and art also seeking understanding. What is art? That's a good question. Here's a more interesting question. What is the value of art in the human experience? Various theories have been advanced over the years. Pleasure, beauty, expression or stimulation of emotion. But as the philosopher Gordon Graham has argued, none of them can on its own explain the special value of great art. So what does Graham propose? That art is valuable as a source of knowledge and understanding. Aesthetic cognitivists like Christoph Baumberger have argued that artworks can provide us with new categories and new perspectives. Art, he says, can raise important questions provide us with knowledge of what it would be like to have certain experiences or emotions or to be in a certain situation. Art can contrive thought experiments and deepen our understanding by enabling us to grasp connections between things we already know or believe. Art, according to aesthetic cognitivists, can improve our cognitive abilities. From this perspective, we don't look independently at reality and measure art's depiction of it by comparison. Instead, we experience the world in new ways through art. But is there an empirically demonstrable connection between art and understanding with reference to what Sir John Templeton referred to as spiritual reality in particular? Can art unlock new spiritual information? We're putting aesthetic cognitivism to the test. We're inviting painters. So uh, uh, there's a correlation here between theology seeking understanding and art also seeking understanding. So we can ask under what conditions and in what ways does participation in art, either in its production or its reception, stimulate the, the, same, uh, uh, the same understanding or the same experience or a similar understanding experience that studying God does. In other words, how does it stimulate theological understanding or um, sense making about what God is, or to use Paul Tillich's term, ultimate reality? How does art do that? Um, so, if, in other words, if theology is seeking understanding and art is also seeking understanding, then uh, when uh, seeking understanding of spiritual realities, uh, which this can happen with or without faith or between people of diverse faith traditions uh, when, when we have art as a source of theology. And uh, the same source for anyone seeking understanding of spiritual reality um, can mean that we can go to that source in order to understand uh, what it is we're, 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 um, we're, we're looking at. Uh, therefore, um, Conversations uh, around theological ideas like salvation or revelation uh, can be understood through the pictorial content and through the pictorial form. Uh, that's not necessarily specific to one religion, but the idea crosses religious boundaries. And we'll look at some artworks that do that shortly. Um, so here is uh, so there is a connection between art and theology on the level of what the Templeton Trust is calling aesthetic cognitivism. We're putting aesthetic cognitivism to the test. We're inviting painters, sculptors, musicians, artists of all kinds, along with art historians and musicologists, philosophers and theologians, and scientists from the psychological, cognitive, and social sciences to conceive and design empirical and statistical studies of the cognitive significance of the arts as it relates to spiritual realities and the discovery of new spiritual information. Art seeking understanding so if theology is seeking to understand what is believed about god and ultimate reality then the question is what does art seek to understand for, for me personally when i delve into these questions 
I find that religious truth and artistic truth uh, are, are epistemologically quite similar. That is, they both provide sense making about ultimate reality. Or again, to use uh, Tillich's term, um, 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 spiritual reality. Um, so the question becomes, to what extent do they both seek to understand and probe the same ideas? And there have already been significant thinkers who have researched into these questions that we may be familiar with. For example, Hegel, Tillich, Schatmaritan, Kant, um, Heidegger, Kierkegaard, uh, um, um, David Bentley, John Templeton, uh, to be honest, virtually all great philosophers have probed these questions, even including uh, religious thinkers too, uh, including the, the modern popes from Pius XII uh, up until Francis have looked at what art is for, um, what art can be as a source for theology. Um, so regarding what uh, Pope Francis says about art, he has quite a modern and unique utilitarian view associated with the upgrading of waste material. Um, and he makes an extraordinary connection uh, that makes art valuable on another level, that of, um, of stewardship or um, kaitiakiatanga. So have a quick listen to how Pope, the, the, the current Pope Francis uh, uh, connects art back to uh, theology or makes it relevant for us today. La vita umana, la persona, non sono più sentite come valore primario da rispettare e tutelare. C'è un'indole del rifiuto che ci accomuna, che induce a non guardare il prossimo come ad un fratello da accogliere. Si tratta di una mentalità che genera quella cultura dello scarto che non risparmia niente e nessuno. Dio non conosce la nostra attuale cultura dello scarto. In Dio non c'entra questo. Dio non scarta nessuna persona. I think it's a, an extraordinary connection that uh, Pope Francis is making here between art and our culture of waste, uh, with the idea that God doesn't waste anything or anyone, uh, that we all have value and that everything on, on the planet has, has value in a sense too. And um, have you ever walked into a, a, an art gallery and seen a work of art that has used recycled material um, uh, um, or even waste material to pr produce what's held in the Art Institute to be a work of art? And uh, we look at it and we think, um, not that I would speak for anyone else, but we look at it and we think, my gosh, um, how is this art? Um, th there's a movement away from, the, from art having to be about formal beauty. Uh, but but going back to a, a very old idea of art being right reason in making things or a purpose behind that that is um, that is uh, meaningful, um, um, and I think that's what the Pope is talking about here with this extraordinary utilitarian function of tying art in also to not to not being wasteful. Um, I just think that's an interesting connection on another level. But you also you also might have noticed that at the end uh, he said uh, that art, art is quote the strongest proof that the incarnation is possible. And for me, this is a very loaded statement that the Pope is making uh, because what does it mean uh, incarnation? 
for Catholics, we know uh, that the incarnation, even, even non-Catholics would know that Catholics believe the incarnation is the revelation of God's self in a human form. Um, you know, in another sense, um, in Islam, um, um, Allah's will and law is um, in, 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 in liberated, put into a book. So even though we wouldn't use the word incarnated and in, fleshed, but it's embooked. So it's embodied in a sense too. Uh, but the question becomes, um, you know, how do we present the, the idea of incarnation in a pictorial art form? Um, you know, God, God's own art of God's self um, is an image of God's self in us, um, and, and we, we kind of get that, um, and, and the exemplar being being Jesus, yet the concept of incarnation exists in several other, other uh, religions, so what is an interfaith image of the incarnation? And this is a this is a work that some of you might be familiar with. It's Mark Rothko's Red Over White, and we and we see it, and uh, we um, we we may not associate this with a learned understanding of what the incarnation is, um, but if we if we reflect on this and think about it, um, red has meaning and white has meaning, and uh, the the white often in religion, um, and this is not typical of Christianity, but Eastern. Um, Eastern religions as well, and, and and just the concept of white usually is associated with spiritual reality, um, and red is usually associated with flesh, uh, with blood, um, and things like that. So there are um, trans-religious identities or or um, you know theological meanings to these chromes. Um, so when when we have a work of uh, work like red over white, which I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm I'm giving an interpretation to this in an interfaith context. I don't know whether Mark Rothko would like it or not, but that's not the point. But the, but the white is submerged into the red, or the white takes on red. So it, th this is this is to me this is the spiritual taking on the flesh, uh, because that's what incarnation is. Um, um, so the, the, this would be a an interfaith pictorial statement um, of incarnation. Therefore, it would it would make art and theology an inclusive um, enterprise on that level. I know it's easy to do this, this with abstract art, um, but abstract art is also said to be secular, which I would disagree with because I would think uh, that in that um, abstraction and in it being art, it would be relevant for theology again across religious borders. So these are the questions uh, that, uh, that that this uh, thesis is looking at. Um, the research questions, are the arts a place we can go to to learn about God? That is, can they be a source for theology? If so, can this be done across religious borders for inter-theological engagement and perhaps global theological development as well? In doing so, then, um, can art assist in the practice of um, interreligious and interfaith dialogue? Therefore, in peace building, essentially, um, relationships be between people of diverse faith traditions, respecting the differences, but understanding them through this medium um, of art. So these are the re research questions. Um, art and theology. Can art inform topics in theology? Can the existence and varieties of art address or affect theological questions about God, about faith and belief and worship. Arguing God from the arts, is it possible to infer something of the non-physical, perhaps divine existence um, of spiritual reality from the physical um, uh, through human experience of art? And can we argue for the existence of God through art? Can the arts reveal the divine attributes if God is the overall or remote creator and art is a feature of um, human um, experience and emotion, then can examining the arts help discern characteristics of what we uh, understand God to be? And can we infer from various aspects of art various divine attributes? Also, art and religious experience. Uh, what is the relationship between experiencing an artwork and experiencing God? So therefore, can the arts generate or trigger um, things that Catholics might call actual grace or simply religious experience? And can they be occasions of um, stirring up the soul to be inspired to transcend uh, 
towards something greater than ourselves through our um, through through our feelings, through our reason, um, or through us associating with 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 the divine attributes. Art and religious belief. Is there a relationship between the arts and belief in God? Arts and uh, religious practice, the liturgy. Um, why are the arts so deeply um, associated with the uh, religious works, the liturgy, settings and services? And how do the arts work in religious spaces? Um, and finally, uh, the, the co-evolution of art and theology throughout the history of ideas and throughout the history of the world. If art can be a source of theology, then can theology also be a source for art? Um, so what do art and theology have in common that could enable one to be the source of the other? Uh, moving on to looking, looking at um, why only pictorial art? Um, and of course, you know, I know the arguments for and against this, and I'm sure you do too, uh, because the other arts, even the other visual arts, can, um, uh, can be meaningful for religion. But I would argue that there's something special about pictorial art, um, and it's certainly one that seems to have interested most um, artists and observers, probably us if we're honest or we analyze our own participation in art, um, particularly in the West. It's the most widespread and certainly the most influential of the arts is pictorial art. And it's certainly the most accessible um, and one that probably impacts us without knowing about it um, um, in, in our ordinary lives. It's everywhere. Um, and it's the most commonly studied art as well. And it's created and experienced. But there's something special about pictorial art because it's obviously physical, um, and, but it's about space. However, it's also spiritual because it's flat. Therefore, it has that ingress into um, dimensions that we can't see, but we can only experience on another level, if that makes sense. And we can explore that quickly in the, in, in the discussion if you're interested on why I would claim that um, pictorial art is the most um, meaningful for theology. I know that it's easy to say that music is the most spiritual of the arts because phonetic values are non-physical, whereas a painting is also physical. But again, it's physical and, and non-physical at the same time. And that's why I think it's more, uh, more important because we do live in bodies. We are an in embodied um, spiritual being. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's always good to just separate one from the other or always have one in, in music. Um, uh, um, you know, I, I, I know how we can, um, I know that we can talk about phonetic values also being chemical and physical and that kind of thing too, but we don't experience it so much through um, its physicality, through its space. Um, you know, and if we have time, we can, we can contrast it with sculpture and with, uh, with, 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 with architecture too. Um, and, and of course, granted, there are limitations to the experience of pictorial art. And the obvious one, of course, is that we, it has to be seen. Um, 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 but some of the things that I'm saying, I, I, I do appreciate can be said of music and sculpture and, and, and architecture as well, but in another sense, not in the sense that I'm wanting to use here, which is a little more narrow. Um, we're, we're talking about something that embodies space. It makes space visible. Uh, therefore, it is a place. We do go to it. Um, music is not a place. Therefore, uh, music is the embodiment of time. It's not the embodiment of place, which a work of art is um, you know, on a, on a, on a non-physical level. Um, also, pictorial art as a source of theology is about the painting itself. Um, it's about the being of the work of art. Um, it's about its ontology. It's not so much about just the, the content, what's in the canvas, what's in the frame, or its form, you know, what its subject matter is. There's something different about pictorial art. It's ontology um, that makes us experience something in ourselves on a relational level um, that, that I think um, it makes pictorial art quite different. You know, through sight, through seeing the, the, the form. And, and form for me is simply the meaning made visible through what you're looking at. Um, and, and shortly, if we have time, we can look at um, uh, important works of art that just present blackness, um, so, um, or just present white or, or light. So through sight, that, in, that impacts our imagination and our thoughts and our feelings. Um, so pictorial art for me is like a doorway into another world uh, through color and through pictorial metaphor and through the imagination um, as we experience it. Uh, so therefore it presents an opportunity 
uh, to change our perception or to be transformed or to penetrate into what faith calls mystery, mysteries. Um, and that's the power of art. Um, it, there, it, it's fantasiful on some level. That's why I think the epistemological meaning of religion and art are very similar. Um, what I mean by that is that the truth statements of religion and the truth statements of art can never be wrong. We can never be wrong. We cannot accept them or we can uh, uh, re re refute them. Um, but in themselves as art, it can't lie. Um, and neither can religious truth lie. So it can't really be wrong um, as we experience it too. So it, it, it challenges us that offers the opportunity to come in further, deeper into a mystery, to, 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 to penetrate what faith, is, what faith tra traditionally calls a mystery um, through pictorial metaphor, through artistic license. Um, it challenges our ideas. It can make us feel uncomfortable at times too. Um, and religion can make us feel uncomfortable, but art can also make us feel uncomfortable. So even those very controversial works of art that religion rejects, uh, that, 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 that are claimed by some religions to be scandalous, uh, which um, is quite um, uh, quite prevalent today, as, as you all know, in uh, depictions of what is prohibited um, in some religions. Um, and um, I don't want to draw attention to Islam, um, but, in, but, but it's easy uh, to talk about um, how uh, depictions, uh, beautiful, beautiful depictions of art of sentient beings become prohibited um, in certain relig religions. But it's not just Islam, it was Christianity and its origins as well. Uh, but the Christians try to transform what made Christianity feel uncomfortable because remember, those beautiful works of art of pagan gods were worshipped. Um, so the Christians transformed them. Um, my point is, is that art can make us feel uncomfortable, but in that, un, uh, in that discomfort is also like theology, um, an invitation to penetrate into a deeper mystery. Um, you know, um, Christians see uh, uh, a dead man on a cross as a work of art and understand it as a work of love. Therefore, I would say, then why would a painting of the Pope under a rock therefore be offensive? So we ask, what is it about the painting of the Pope under a rock that offends? Uh, and then, then we have to ask, well, what is the meaning behind the artist? depicting that or submerging a crucifix into um as we know um uh, into into a into a, into a liquid uh that that um that, that 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 is seen by some as offensive my point is is that i would argue that even those uncomfortable works of art are in themselves as art a, a source of theology uh, because if christ the son of god can be crowned with thorns and we can make a picture of that then why can't we also depict a um, a an image of the butterfly as the as the womb of a of a of a, of a woman, um, and that and that be offensive um, if if, the, if if it makes sense of what I'm trying to say about um, you know the, the discomfort of some works of art too you know that can cause us to surrender or to to open our minds um, to more than what we we're, what we're comfortable with. Um, So my point is, is that it's being a work of art in itself that I think is also important for theology. And that moves it outside of our comfort zone, outside of our taste. Um, so that's my justification for why, especially non-religious art as well. Um, but then there's another argument too um, that leads us into the point I wanted to make um, regarding non-religious art. Um, you know, the, the being of art, um, and it's easy to do this with abstract art too, but even, even the, the popes, um, who of course are religious leaders, John Paul II stated that even beyond its typically religious expression, true art has a close affinity with the world of faith in his famous letter to the artists. Um, however, the answer to why non-religious art for me is because we are, we are looking at pictorial, pictorial art itself as a source of theology, um, not, not at religious art. Um, uh, this is the whole point of my, of my research. Um, it is the artwork, uh, not its content, not its subject matter, uh, that is a source of theology, the artwork itself. Therefore, the being or the ontological status again of the artwork and this goes back to the same idea of the Templeton Trust, that art seeks understanding. Uh, so the artwork in itself is a place to seek understanding. Um, this means, uh, which I think is an extraordinary factor, 
that um, um, that there may not be any such thing really as religious art or secular art um, as a source of theology. There's only art, um, like creation. We don't talk about a religious creation or a secular creation. There's only creation. And for the Muslim, all creation is sacred. And also for the Maori, um, everything um, has a wairua. Um, I think Christianity can be a little, a little dualistic here and creates a distinction. Um, um, I'm arguing that, um, um, yes, it's art, um, but obviously I'm also arguing that because it's art, um, it could be sacred in itself by being art. And I think this is a very easy argument to make because the artwork is a product of the artist acting like a creator, and therefore a co-creator. And if, if there is a creator God, um, then the, the creator artist is imitating the creator God. So simply by creating art, you are affirming the existence of create, a creative process. Um, certainly not ex nihilo, um, as uh, Catholics believe God created ex nihilo, but then God also participates in creation too, if, if we believe in creation and believe in God. But the, the artist creates, um, I would argue, um, out of matter, ex materia, but always new. Um, therefore, um, I would argue, contrary to some theological positions, uh, that the artwork is a creation. It's not a making um, or a um, production. It is in another sense, but it's also a creation. Um, and it's a new creation because arguably what the artist brings into existence never existed before, at least um, not um, outside of the mind of the artist. And that's very close to how God works in time. Um, uh, by projecting into time what 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 is outside of time in a certain sense in the mind, um, but moving on really quickly. Paul Weiss, Paul Weiss, just a couple of minutes. Um, you know, Paul Weiss was an American what philosopher. Time? In his lecture uh, on religion and art, he contended okay. that religion and art are basic okay. enterprises. Bye that they have um, a variety of important relationships to one another. And on page uh, 14 of his work, Religion and Art, he said, what awakens a thought or an interest in God is not necessarily something religious. And I think that's um, self-evident and we all understand that. But also an Italian historian of art and religion, Daniele Mensotti, um, he claimed that as an expression of humans and their need for God, the arts can help um, even if not Christian, to the intelligence of faith. Um, really quickly, Pope Pius XII, as early as 1952, he stated that, quote, we are far from thinking that to be interpreters of God, you should deal with explicitly religious themes. He was endorsing the principle that whether or not an artwork is religious or secular, uh, the subject of the painting could always be of religious interest. Um, and the, the, the truth of faith can be transmitted via non-religious non ways. And this was also echoed in a statement by Pope Benedict XVI, uh, when he said that art in all its forms, at the point where it en encounters the great questions of our existence, uh, the fundamental themes that give life its meaning, can take on a religious quality, thereby turning into a path of profound inner reflection and spirituality. That was from uh, the, um, the Papa Emeritus. Uh, and Paul Tillich, um, you know, a great existentialist theologian, affirmed that all art is religious, not because everything of beauty stems from God, but because all art expresses a deep content, a direction towards the unconditional. Um, there are many other arguments um, as to why an artwork has, uh, you know, theological bearing, other factors to consider as well. Um, I'd like to just introduce the, these theological concepts to the artwork. We can talk about, about an apophatic artwork, an artwork that affirms something by denying what it's not, and abstract images do this. We'll look at a couple really quickly, shortly. Um, you know, through the contrast of color, the repetition of subject matter, idealized uh, forms. We see these in Mark Rothko's works. Um, and then the opposite, like cataphatic, the more classical figures, um, the harmony of colors and diversity of subjects, which can kind of be read um, as stories. Um, so we can even ascribe these theological terms to works of art too. For example, this is an example of um, you know, contrast of color, an apathetic work of art. In this case, it's blue. 
um, and red. And, you, and if you're familiar with, um, with uh, religious scenes, oftentimes Jesus is red and blue. Again, this is the red flesh of a man um, taking on the blue, um, uh, therefore becoming spiritualized in a way. Uh, so therefore kind of like the incarnation, uh, or, uh, the blue overcoat, um, the, the divinity of Jesus, uh, the, the man in the flesh in the red takes on the blue of um, you know, the sky. Um, kind of thing. So we can, you know, apply these theological um, understandings even to the colors. Um, lastly, why across religious borders? And I'll end on this last note. Uh, we're looking at why, um, why art can be an important theological source um, for inter-religious dialogue or among our friends um, who are of other faiths, uh, we can use the artwork to dialogue around ideas um, that are important to us, especially if we're a believer. Um, I, I think the inter inter interesting religious diversity of our society calls for a better interaction among persons of different religions. And I think art has a high capacity to facilitate uh, that, that diversity. Um, just having a high religious diversity is not enough. I do think we need to come up with ways by which we can uh, manage that diversity. Um, seeing diverse ideas about God, and I, I think art can do that. Here, for example, is Ed Reinhardt's abstract painting number four. I, I appreciate the fact that I'm showing you a very important work of art um, on a Zoom screen, um, but you may be able to appreciate or understand um, the emergence of a cruciform shape from this black work of art, where Reinhardt has simply inserted black squares into the corner of a, a, another shade of black. Um, and, and he simply called it abstract painting number four. But, you know, this could be al Batin. The hidden god of Islam, which is synonymous with the uh, the Deus absconditus of Christianity, you know, the hidden god, um, uh, the unmanifest, um, or the concept of the inner, you know, or deisms, um, Deus um, otius, um, you know, the hidden, the, the hidden, the hidden uh, mystery. Um, you know, it could be a, a homage to infinity or to non-materiality, or it could be simply John Templeton's idea of spiritual reality. But it's not a seeing of 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 um, of physical subject matter. It's a seeing of the mind to understand um, theological ideas. Um, here's a picture um, of a spiritual substance such as um, Islam's al-Wazi, a name for Allah, the vast. The all embracing, the omnipresent, the sublime, um, perhaps oneness of being. Um, this is Kazimir Malevich's White on White. It could, it could represent the brilliant ray of illumination, uh, which is Al Din. Al Din in Islam traced back to the divine oneness as the, the basis of all religions. Um, it could be a visual expression of Islam's Al Nur, the light or Al-Hazer, the manifest. Um, or again, it could be uh, like, like um, the, the black, the black on black, you know, the all embracing, the vast, the omnipresent, um, perhaps the sublime, or perhaps what Zoroastrians, um, according to Hegel, identified as um, um, Ahura Mazda, the embodiment of an endlessly malleable light. Um, indicating the unbounded divine divine presence, but uh, refracted in a certain way through form. It could be Hinduism's um, idea of um, uh, from the, from the Vedas, the seeing the light or the light within the light, um, comparable to that sense of spiritual awakening in our in our in our own selves. Um, in in the Quran, Allah is described as the light of the heavens and the earth. Um, you know, the, the, the same the, the same rhetoric could be used for Malevich's uh, black square, black on white, could be also understood as either Al Batin, the hidden one, um, or or Al Azir, uh, uh, the revealed, um, the divine oneness, the, the Jewish concept of Echad. Or uh, the endless one in Judaism, Ein Sof, I am who I am, the absolute being. You know all of these concepts. We could ask, what does solidness mean? What does um, you know, black? What does black mean? Black is a cataphatic color. It's all colors in one, um, in a sense. Um, by reducing the pictorial content to a simple 
um, uh, a geometric and monochromic shape. Malevich has moved towards a multi-dimensional universe, which is highly useful for interreligious dialogue. Um, since black square is open to many interpretations, the conversation can easily um, translate into an interreligious discourse. And again, we've looked at um, you know the meaning of color and how even colors can um, can inform a concept which is specific to a religion uh, to help others learn about that concept, which may also subsist in their religions in a different way. This could be Hinduism's moksha, liberation. Um, or it could be Buddha, Buddhism's stillness, but my interpretation is that it's the incarnation um, conceptually. Um, so I think um, there's, there's some lovely artworks here that um, also look at how um, these figures could be of interest across religious borders. Um, these inform the universality of art, the interculturality of art. To, um, but I think I, at this point, I'll bring us to the conclusion um, that that um, that you know, that you know, obviously art is important for religion. Though I'm I'm arguing that it can be a formal place, a theological source uh, for us to go to to understand more deeply um, about um, God, and we can do that today in a informed. Um, uh, an informed and responsible way uh, among among people of diverse religions too. So I think that's the power of art, and and that's the point of this talk tonight. So thank you very much for um, for 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 listening to me, uh, and allowing me this this opportunity to express these ideas. And I'm really interested in um, your own. Um, points of view, and also any questions or challenges you might have um, on this topic. Um, so thank you, Jovi.